Proverbs 3 and verse 9. So we're, or we put Solomon and we're following his, his steps here. Solomon switches gears here and, and moves on to a totally a different subject. This would be the fifth couplet. And the, the first part of the couplet here is the commandment. And then we'll look at the, the promise associated with it, the blessing associated with the commandment next time. So Proverbs 3 and verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So let's look at that first part. Honor the Lord with thy substance. So like I said, in this verse and the next is, com- is contained the commandment and then the blessing as- attached to the commandment. And we are supposed to honor God with our substance, we're told here. So let's define the terms. Substance means possessions, goods, state, means wealth, chiefly as a reminiscence of biblical language. So this is, this is how the Bible uses the term. An amount of wealth, a fortune, plural riches, or possessions. Okay, so your substance is your wealth, your possessions, right? Material things. This is to honor the Lord with them. To honor is to do honor to, pay worthy respect to, by some outward action, to worship, performs one devo- one's devotions to, to do obeisance or homage to, to celebrate. So I take from this that a key element of worshiping God is giving a portion of our wealth to him, of our income. Because to honor means to worship God, right? So this is a part of God's worship. Now, on the other hand, we live in a nation whose God is their belly. Remember, that's what it says there in Philippians 3 and verse 19. And they honor that God the way that the prodigal son honored that God, and that was by wasting his substance with riotous living. Remember uh, Luke 15 and verse 13? It's interesting that same word substance is used here in both of these verses. <clears throat> Luke 15 and verse 13, you remember the prodigal son where he, he, the, the man had two sons and the younger one said, give me the, give me the goods that befalleth me, that falleth to me. And his father gave him his inheritance and he went out and he squandered it with riotous living. And it says there in, um, in verse 13, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took a journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. So he was honoring that God of the world, which is his belly. He was doing the things that pleased him and living like a fool. And living like a fool is fun while it lasts, but it doesn't usually last very long. This guy ha- apparently had a nice little inheritance, but it didn't take long for it to all be gone. And then he's out there feeding the swine and looking at the swine's food, thinking that it looks pretty good. And then he realizes, you know what? Servants in my dad's house have it better than I do. I'll go back and repent and, and humble myself and become a servant in my own dad's house. And that's what he did. But anyway, I just that's kind of beside the point. But this verse here, getting back to Proverbs 3, nine, this is an imperative statement. It's not a suggestion uh, for the people of God. So here's something to consider. And sometimes when we make analogies to things, it really, it really brings it home. So the Word of God commands us to give a portion of our substance to the government in the form of taxes as well, right? Pro, uh, Romans 13, 6 through 7. Romans 16. Romans 16. 13, pardon me, Romans 13. And by the way, this, I, I'm preaching this sermon because I have to, because it's verse 9, and that's the next verse, right? So I'm not preaching this sermon for any reason. Like it's, I'm not, I'm not hinting at any of you in this room. Okay. So just so you know, uh, Romans 13, six through seven. For, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. The ministers he's referring to here are government, uh, officials, government authorities that God has established for the, the, promotion of good and the punishment of evil. They're God's ministers. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, it's like a tax, custom to whom custom, custom to whom custom, right there's another, um, another ellipsis, Judy. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom 
is due, right? An ellipsis that takes out the is due. Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So Christians are told to render to the government our taxes, right? To, to whom they are due. And so we, we give of our substance to the government for the service so-called service they provide anyway. <laughs> they, they really do a lot of other nefarious things with it. But anyway, we do that. So I just wonder, like I said, not about anybody in this room, but I just wonder why some Christians obey the commandment to honor the government with their substance but refuse, neglect, or forget to honor God with it. And I've, you know, I've seen this happen in, in my life at different times. Um, I've observed this in people, and I always thought it was just strange. Like, nobody ever forgets to pay their mortgage, right? You wouldn't dream of it, right? But, I mean, I've seen people shortchange the pastor, just think nothing of it. Oh, I forgot, you know, it's been a month or so. Sorry about that or whatever. And it's like, well, you do tell that to the IRS. <laughs> I mean, how many people, you know, come April 15th, oh, I just forgot. And IRS command comes knocking on the door. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Or, yeah, it's, it's funny how people think, but... Both of these are commandments from God, but the former one, that is rendering the substance to the government, the former one is more often obeyed because of the belief that to not do so will result in severe punishment, such as imprisonment or death. And that's ultimately, I don't know about you, that's why I pay taxes, because I don't want to be put in prison or killed. And then you say, oh, that's crazy. No, really, if you don't pay your taxes, and then you don't pay the fines associated with that, then yeah, they'll come and take you and put you in prison. And if you resist, then they'll kill you. I mean, really, that, that's actually how it works. You know, they're not contributions to the government, right? I mean, they, based, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. based on what you just read in Romans 13, though, we are supposed to cheerfully do that, but does the question become at what point <clears throat> it's not a fair tax anymore? Yeah, well, and, and the income, the federal income tax isn't even legal. I mean, they, they say it is, but it's not. According to the Constitution, the, the federal government can't levy a, a tax directly on the people unless it's apportioned, which the income tax is not apportioned. And <clears throat> so it's not really even a, a legal tax anyway. We didn't even have it for the first hundred and some years of the country's existence. So, so yeah, that's, I basically, I, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's morally right. I don't think it's legally right, but I do it because I don't want to be killed basically, or thrown in jail. And it's like Jesus said, you know, whenever they, they asked him about paying taxes and he went and got a, you know, a, a, a coin out of the, had Peter go out and get a coin out of the fish's mouth and he said, give it unto them for me and for thee, lest they be offended. <clears throat> I just don't want to offend them and get, you know, get on their bad side. So, so I pay the taxes. <clears throat> but ideally, yes, if you had a a tax that was actually legal according to the own legal the, according according to the legal system that we live under if it was a legal tax then yeah we should pay it we are we're bound to pay it so anyway <clears throat> the government is not the only one though that promises painful judgment for those who don't give them their due <clears throat> it's like i think some people have more faith and more belief in the threats of the government than they do in the threats of God. Because God says, you don't do this and I'm going to punish you. And people are like, eh, I doubt it. But the government says, you don't do this, I'm going to punish you. You toe the line, right? Or God says, you do this, I'm going to bless you. And people are like, ah, how can he do that? But, you know, if somebody else told you that, then you'd probably believe him. So I think it comes to the faith of the unseen because you can see the government Mm -hmm. but you can't see God standing right in front of you yeah and that's what it comes down to it comes down to faith it is I'm totally convinced of that because if you believed it if you believed the the promises and the threats you would certainly give the Lord his due God likewise threatens to curse and punish those who don't give him his due look at uh, Malachi Three eight through nine, <clears throat> Malachi three eight through nine. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherewith, wherein have we robbed thee? 
In tithes and offerings, God says, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. So yeah, there is a curse from God upon those that don't honor him with their substance. God expects that. Look at Haggai 1, 9 through 11. Haggai, 9, uh, Haggai 1, 9 through 11. If you just start flipping back, you'll find it. It's hidden away there somewhere. Here we go. It's after Zephaniah and before Zechariah. What's that? There you go. Yeah, that's right. It's between the two Zs. Zephaniah and Zechariah. Zechariah is right before Malachi. Haggai 1, 9 through 11. The Lord says, <clears throat> the problem was, these. this is when Israel had, they had returned to the land after the Babylonian captivity. They'd started building the temple and the city, and then they left off to build the house of the Lord, and they were building their own houses. And it wasn't little tents either. It was wainscoted uh, houses and, you know, was sealed houses there, it says, and so anyway, the Lord was upset because they were not building his house, but they were taking care of their own. And he says there in verse 9, Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. They were blowing their money on that on their own stuff, so God said, I'll blow your money for you. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man to his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. So the Lord is holding back the fruits of the earth. Right There is now a dearth in the land, because they were not taking care of the house of God. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. So the Lord had brought a, a depression. He had brought it upon the, the, the basic needs, like the corn, and, he had, and the ground, and then he'd also brought it upon the, uh, the finer things in life, the more enjoyable things in life, like the wine and the oil, and also upon men and their labor. So here you have a depression throughout the land, because people were looking out for themselves and not taking care of the Lord's house, the Lord's service. Now, as the scripture says, Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, the old hymn even tells us that the God that lived in the olden times is just the same today. So God... God thinks about people not taking care of his house and his work in the same way as he did back then. So I would say those who pay taxes to uh, those who pay their taxes but not their God demonstrate that they fear men more than him and that they believe the threats of men more than the threats of the Lord. Like I said, nobody forgets to pay their taxes, nobody pays them late, right? And nobody nobody would, would even dream of doing that, but when it comes the other way around, you know, yeah, not really too concerned about it. Some people have that attitude anyway. Such have their priorities backward and should, like it says in Hebrews chapter 12, 28 and 29, serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire, lest they end up on the receiving end of his rod. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be on the receiving end of that rod. Okay, so back to Proverbs 3 9. So it says, Honor the Lord with thy first fruits, or with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all that increase. So let's look at that, what it means to honor the Lord with the first fruits of all our increase. So, first fruit is defined as the fruits first gathered in a season, the earliest products of the soil, especially with reference to the custom of making offerings of these to God. So first fruits, I mean, the, the word kind of just gives it away what it means. It means the fruits that are first. The first fruits that, the, that are produced from the land, those get given to God. That's what the Lord's saying here. In other words, to give one's first fruits is to give God a portion of one's income first before any other expenses are paid. So if you kind of put it into our own day, 
most of us aren't farmers and we don't have the first fruits. So whenever we, when we have a harvest, then we don't give the, you know, that, that first part of the harvest to the Lord. But it's the same principle applies today. We give God first of our income before we take care of anything else. That's what we should do anyway. So bringing this down practically then, when creating a budget, a Christian should determine what percentage of his income that the Lord should get and then make that the first line of his budget. So that should be number one, and that's how mine is. That the very first thing, literally, that I do every time I get paid is I take that 10% and shave it off into a different account, right? And then I take the other percentage and I put that in the government's account because I, you know, because I'm self-employed, I have to put it away and then send them a check every three months. So yeah, I, the God gets His part first, and I even and would it matter? I mean, there's like three seconds difference there. I could give the government theirs first and I give God his, even though it's only a three second difference, I still give God his first just out of sheer principle that the first thing that happens is God gets his part. And then Uncle Sam gets his part. And then everybody else gets their part. The remainder of the budget should then be allotted for all other expenses such as savings, taxes, housing, transportation, food, clothing, utilities, education, entertainment, all that kind of stuff. That's comes after, right? That's the second, third, and fourth fruits, whatever. That's not the first fruits, or shouldn't be anyway. But sadly, some Christians budget precisely opposite of God's prescription. They pay all of their expenses first and then give God whatever's left if there is any. Now that's not called first fruits. You know what that's called? Leftovers. God didn't say, give of the Lord of thy substance and of the leftovers of some of your increase. Right? That's, that's not what he said, did he? That's leftovers. And I've seen people that give of their first fruits, and I've seen God's blessing upon them. And I've seen people give leftovers, and I've also seen what happens to them. I have, I have watched it with my own two eyes. So this, this one is true for sure. Sacrifices they were, if they had blind right. calves or whatever they were getting yep. the sickly ones because hey, you're gonna do them in and yeah, you know we won't exactly get anyway. Yeah, that's exactly what what the Lord was saying in Malachi that they brought to him. I think it was in Malachi oh, okay. where they brought to him the lame and the blind and the yeah, spotted. And, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Oh, I don't think I re- actually read that verse though, but yeah, that's that was in that same passage there, right? And you know, people think, oh well, like you said. That's going to get sacrificed anyway, right? I mean, I may as well give him the blind one. What, I don't want the, some blind sheep running around here. And, but the Lord, he wants the first, he wants the, the nice one, right? He wants that for himself. Now, here's a question. So how do we give God our first fruits when he's in heaven and you can't really physically give it to him, right? He's not here to give it to him. So we can't personally give to God in this life, but we can give to his work on this earth. And that's how we give to him. And I'll show you this from the scripture. Look in Numbers 5, 8 through 10. And there's, and there's about at least three different ways um, that we can support the Lord's work in this earth. Numbers 5, 8 through 10. It says, but if a man have no kinsman, let me make sure, is this the right numbers? 5, 8 through 10, yeah, I guess so, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. But if the man has no kinsman, have no kinsman to recompense the trespass unto, let the trespass be recompensed unto the Lord, even to the priest. Now, even defines what was just said there. So he says, recompense it to the Lord, even to the priest. So in other words, when you gave it to the priest, you had given it to the Lord. See how that, see that? Beside the ram of the atonement, whereby an atonement shall be made for him. And every offering of all the holy things of the children of Israel, which they bring unto the priest, shall be his. And every man's hallowed thing shall be his. Whatsoever any man giveth the priest, it shall be his. And when they gave to the priest, they were giving it to the Lord. Now, under the Old Testament, 
Israel was supposed to support God's ministers, which were the priests and the Levites in that system, with their first fruits. Then, uh, with their first fruits, because the priests and the Levites had no inheritance in Israel, they were not supposed to be out working in the fields. They were rather supposed to be working in the house of God and uh, encouraging themselves in the word of God. Look at Deuteronomy eighteen one through five. Deuteronomy eighteen one through five. So when Israel inherited the land of Canaan, the Levites, the tribe of the Levites, which included included the priests because they were the sons of Aaron, which was a Levite. So the priests and Levites, they had no inheritance. They didn't get their own plot of land because the Lord was their inheritance. And therefore they were supported by the other 12 tribes, other 11 tribes. Now Deuteronomy 18, 1 through 5 says, the priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, as he hath said unto them. And this shall be the priests do from the people, from them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be ox or sheep, and they shall give unto the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks, and the maw, the first fruit also of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thy oil, thine oil, and the first of the fleece of the sheep, of thy sheep, shalt thou, give un, shalt thou give him. For the Lord thy God hath chosen him out of all the tribes, uh, out of all thy tribes, to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. So he didn't have an inheritance. So he was given what was given, part of what was given to the Lord was then given to the priest. That was his portion. Look at Ezekiel 44 and verse 30. Showing you how it was done back in the Old Testament. And then I'll show you how the same principle applies in the New. <clears throat> Ezekiel forty-four thirty. And the first of all the first fruits of all things, and every oblation of all, and of every sort of your oblations shall be the priests. Ye shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough. See, they were supposed to give the priest their dough. That's D O U G H, though. <laughs> Ye shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessing to rest in thine house. You see, it's a blessing to people that give to the priest because the priest causes a blessing to come back to them. The priest shall not eat of anything that is dead of itself or torn, whether it be fowl or beast. Okay, so <clears throat> they were supposed to give, I want you to notice something there in verse 30, the first of all the first fruits. So you have the first fruits, which were given to the Lord, and the first of the first fruits were given to the priest. And I never, I don't know if I really thought, I don't think, I don't think I based my own actions on this verse necessarily, but whenever I was a church member, like of my tithe, the first part of it went to the pastor, right? It was like, so the first of the first fruits I was given to the pastor. And then the, you know, the, the, the rest of it was used for other things. <clears throat> Oh, where was it? Oh, yeah, in uh, 2 Chronicles 31, verse 4. 2 Chronicles 31, 4. Second Chronicles 31, 4. <clears throat> Moreover, he commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. And then let's, no, that's, that's all we're going to read there. We're going to, we will get to verse five later on. So anyway, they were supposed to give to the priests and Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. So they would be able to study the word and minister the word. And that was their encouragement. And then let me give you one more. Nehemiah 13, 10 through 12. <clears throat> You know, bringing this over to the New Testament, that is encouraging to a pastor. 
I, I, there were well the primitive Baptists at least they used to be they used to be standard practice where at least among some of them where they didn't support their pastors at all they were expected to to work full time and pastor and which I don't I just don't understand well, number one I mean there's so many verses in the Bible in the New Testament that, that tell you otherwise I don't know where that came from or why. I mean, that just seemed, would seem to be a very counterproductive thing if you wanted a pastor that was actually going to have some time to study and teach. And so I don't, I don't get that. But anyway, but this was a, this is a, a uh, principle both Old and New Testament. Nehemiah thirteen ten through twelve. And then, as I, I think I know, I've made this point before. But then they also forbid them to use notes in their sermons. So then you take a guy that's been working forty or fifty hours a week. And then you don't even allow him to have an outline so he can remember what he's trying to say in the you know spare 10 minutes that he had to study the word after he got done you know working and trying to provide for his, himself and his family. And, and then you expect a good sermon out of him, which is... I don't ever remember even when I was growing up ever hearing a sermon on tithing in church or, or, or ever hearing my dad ever say anything, well, take 10% of your allowance and put it somewhere. Really? Never, huh. Ever. Huh. Never. Yeah, that's... In, I don't... That is strange. I don't understand that. I don't, I don't, I would love, I would like to talk to some one of them. I don't know if they still do that, but it'd be interesting just to hear the rationale, like you know why why they did that. But I'll tell you that is one thing. I didn't, I didn't learn a whole lot of things in the church that I grew up in. When I don't even know if I learned this in the church, but one thing that my dad, two things that my dad taught me by example, were and, and by precept, were tithing and church attendance. That was one thing where we didn't miss church for, I mean, we would go, you know, might we go to a union convention or something like that. We'd miss the occasional Sunday or something, but um, I probably told you this too, but um, whenever I was in high school, I was in the ski club and we would go skiing up in New York state, which was you know, a couple, two, three hours away. And we'd go up there every Saturday night. We'd leave at about noon or one o'clock in the afternoon, get up there four or five o'clock and then ski into the night until nine or 10 o'clock and then come home and get home at I don't know, one, one thirty in the morning. And we did this every Saturday for January and February. And the deal was though, that you can be in the ski club, but you will be in church on Sunday morning and you will not be sleeping in church on Sunday morning. And so that's what we did. But that was the deal. No missing church. If I'd have missed church, there would have been no ski club. So that's those are two things that I learned from my dad. And I appreciate those to this day. Nehemiah thirteen ten through 12. Nehemiah says, And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field, like the primitive Baptist example I was just telling you there. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? See, whenever the ministers weren't provided for, the house of God was forsaken. And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasuries. So sometimes people need the leader there to set them in their place. Now this time he didn't pull their hair out, but other times Nehemiah did. He plucked their hair out, he said, because he was so irritated with them. Right there in verse 25, actually. And I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters unto their sons, and nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. He was mad they were marrying you know, heathens out of the faith. And um, he ripped out their hair and uh, made them, <laughs> smote them, smote them, beat them, ripped out their hair and made them swear by God. That's quite the leader right there. Now, this principle is carried over into the New Testament. Not the one I just mentioned, but the, the, the previous <laughs> ones. So. I'm not sure I could get away with... I'm not to be a striker, so I, I don't think I'd get away with, with smiting anybody and pulling your hair out. God's ministers were supposed to be supported by the congregation under the law of Moses, and in like manner, God's ministers of his churches are likewise to be support, supported by their church under the New Testament. <clears throat> Let's look at 1 Corinthians 9, 
6 through 14. Well, not, and not to mention, getting back, I'm not, not trying to bust on the Primitive Baptist, but think about all the foregone blessings that would have attended those churches had they been doing what God said and giving them his first fruits and then experiencing the blessing of the next verse that we'll look at next time. I, I imagine all those blessings that would have been there were withheld because they weren't doing what God said, giving them, giving him uh, their first fruits. 1 Corinthians 9, 6-14. Paul says, Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Because he was, Paul could, he didn't have to work outside the ministry, but he did to, as, to teach people. He, there were certain immature churches that needed to be taught how to work, like the Thessalonian church. If any should not work, neither should he eat. And Paul was giving them an example. But he had the power to forbear it. He didn't have to. Who goeth a warfare any time in his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? So nobody would go to war on your own dime, right? The, the, the government's going to support you if you go off to be a soldier, obviously. Nobody would plant a vineyard and not expect to eat the fruit of it. You wouldn't plant a vineyard and let somebody else eat the fruit of it, right? That, that, Nobody would do that. Nobody would feed the flock and not get the milk of the flock, right? When you work, then you're rewarded with the rewards of your labor. That's what Paul's saying here. This is why this whole welfare state and taxing people to give it to other people and everything, you're not able to eat the own milk of your flock. You're, you're, you know, you're tending the flock and then somebody else is drinking the milk of it. And that's not right. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thus or, thou shalt not muzzle the, mox, the, the, mox, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes no doubt this is written. That he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. That, those verses are actually a good justification for types and shadows preaching. Now, I don't overdo types and shadows, but Paul says here that the law of Moses said, thou shalt not muzzle the, the, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. And then he says, was God talking about oxen there or was he talking about us? And Paul says, does he not say no doubt? No doubt this is written about us. So he's saying there, yeah, there was a physical type and a shadow there that if you had an ox treading out the corn, you would let the ox eat while he worked, right? It, would be, it wouldn't be right to have him working his little tail off or his big tail off and not be able to eat while he worked. But Paul says what that was really written for was not for the ox. That was teaching a spiritual principle for us. So that's, that is a, just, a good justification for giving for spiritualizing some of the things in the Old Testament and showing how they really apply in the New Testament. Like Israel, for instance. The people of Israel, the nation of Israel, was a picture of God's chosen people, right? His elect covenant people, Jew and Gentile. So anyway, I just thought that was interesting. I, that just kind of hit me right there. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So the preacher studies and he preaches to you and teaches you spiritual things and then he reaps carnal things. That's how it's supposed to work. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? So Paul's saying other preachers have done this. Paul and I and Barnabas, we could do the same thing. We, we have that power, he's saying. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. We just read the verses that he's referring to. Remember that whenever you brought the offering to the Lord and part of it was the priest and the Levites, this is exactly what he's speaking of there. And here's verse 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So here he makes application that just like it was under that law of Moses, it's the same way. Preachers live off of the support of their congregation just like the priests and the Levites lived off the support of the congregation of Israel. It's the exact same thing, same principle.
Now, another way to give to God under the Old Testament was to give to the poor, the widows, and the fatherless. So this was, it wasn't only to the priests and the Levites that was supposed to be part of, of their giving to the Lord. It was also to the less fortunate. Look at Deuteronomy 26, 12 through 13. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 26, 12 through 13. It says, When thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase, the third year, which is the year of tithing, and hast given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled, then thou shalt say before the Lord thy God, I have brought away the hallowed things out of mine house, and also have given them unto the Levite, and unto the stranger, and to the fatherless, and to the widow, according to all thy commandments, which thou hast commanded me. I have not transgressed thy commandments, neither have I forgotten them. So, the Lord had commanded a tithe, and this was the tithe at the end of the third year. So there was actually three tithes um, in, in Israel. And this tithe was to be given to not only the Levite, but to the stranger, fatherless, and widow. So it was to be given to the poor, the less fortunate, that couldn't take care of themselves because of their circumstances. And it was not to be kept back. Right? So we can take this principle too. When you've purposed in your heart that you're going to give X percentage or X dollar amount or whatever to the Lord's work, and that includes to the church, the ministry, and to the poor, then you don't ever keep that for yourself, right? Now, I, I have taught you, and, and I practice this myself, to keep that in a separate account or in a envelope or something where that's laid aside so you'll have to give to the poor. But when that's set aside, that's the Lord's money. Now, maybe you think that I'm too extreme, but I would starve to death before I would take my Lord's money and feed myself with it. Now, I'd feed somebody else with it, but I would never take that money and use it for myself. That is just, that is my personal, now maybe that's, maybe that's just too extreme. Maybe God would never expect that of me or anybody else. And that could be, but that's just my thing. I just, when that money is set aside, that's his. And I'm, I'm not going to touch that. And this is what, what, um, what, uh, what, the, what they were saying here. The, they didn't keep it back. They, they gave what they were supposed to give to the poor. The, the the tough part, I think, is I'm sure there's plenty of poor people out there, but it's number one, finding them, and number two, finding ones that are in genuine need and that would be actually helped by the support and not harmed by it. Because a lot of people, you're just, you're perpetuating them and their folly to give to them, and you're not helping them, really. What they, what they need is a good slap upside the head. It'd be nice if you could just identify the ones that if they had some help, it would get them over the hump and then they'd be fine. But most people, I think, they are like below the hump because of their own decisions. And if you get them over the hump, they're just going to fall right back down as soon as you stop helping them because there'll be an even bigger hump. There'll be a bigger hump, right. And they're going to be dependent. And so it's that's the hardest thing for me. I I'm always conflicted about that when I see one of those guys panhandlers on the side of the road or something and I always think, should I give to him? Should I not give to him? And and then I've talked to a Christian brother the other day in another church and, and he was making the case a lot of these guys have PTSD and they're messed up and they can't they they can't work in social environments because they're so screwed up in the head and, and they're they're willing to humiliate themselves on the side of the road to to get help and and so I don't and I thought, yeah, I mean, maybe you have a point. I, I don't know. It's just a really, that's a hard one for me. Oh, I think, I'm sure that's the case with some of them for sure. Because if it wasn't so <clears throat> lucrative, you wouldn't see 15 of them standing in a hump, mm-hmm. all with signs trained to get money from people. Yeah. They would go to the businesses, if they were desperate enough, yeah. that had hiring for higher signs. Yeah. Oh, I agree. And that's, that's kind of what I, I think is the case with most of them. This guy was saying that with some of them that they just, they're so screwed up in the head that they just can't hardly, they can't do that. They can't be around other people. And, and I don't know. I'm not in their head. I can't, I don't, it's just hard to tell. I don't know. 
told you about that guy about the arms. I told you about that. That makes you wonder, even at that point, what are you, what are you, what are you seeing and what they really need? Yeah. You know, yeah. He, he, thought he didn't have any arms. He was putting his arms back. Oh, he was faking it. Yeah. He was going into, into McDonald's and people was opening the door up asking for money. Actually, he saw him go out one morning on the way to work. He went behind the dumpster, pulled his arms out, and just the money was lost. He did the same thing, walked back in McDonald's. <laughs> wow. Somebody needed to take that guy's arms out of his shirt and beat him with him. I know. <clears throat> I have a personal theory that if not getting the job and begging like that was more closely associated with starving, <laughs> I think there'd be less people in need. Oh, yeah. I yeah. think that they rely on handouts and government handouts and handouts from people, and so they just keep being fed. Yeah. And But if they really thought, you know, I'm going to starve to death if I don't get a job, it'd be amazing how many people oh, yeah. are suddenly able to work hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hunger is quite the incentive. You're dang yeah. right it is. Yeah. Yeah, you can blame a lot of that on the government. It's subsidizing folly. Proverbs 19 and verse 17. But if anybody ever does come across a truly a person that is truly in need, please let me know because I really I do have money set aside for that purpose, but I just have a hard time finding somebody maybe I just don't run in the right circles or something but I have a hard time finding somebody that I'm I'm genuinely think is really a candidate for it uh, Proverbs 19 and verse 17 it says he that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord and that which he hath given him will he pay him again so when we give to somebody that is in need somebody that's poor it's as if you're making a loan to God and God says I'll pay it back that guy can't pay it back and you shouldn't expect them to pay it back because if it's charity, you're giving it to them and it's not a loan, right? But it's a loan to, to God. He'll give it back. And this principle is also taught in the New Testament. God's people are to um, be responsible to, uh, to support the poor and the widows and the fatherless. And this goes for, for ministers as well as uh, church members. Romans 12 and verse 13. <clears throat> Romans 12 and verse 13. Just a short verse. Distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Not to the desires, not to the lusts of saints, but to the necessity of saints. Look at Galatians 2, 9 through 10. Whenever... Uh, Paul had joined himself with the other apostles and then it was determined that that Paul and Barnabas would go to the Gentiles and that Peter and John and James would go to the Jews. Peter was, was fine with that. He was happy that Paul was there, but he just wanted Paul to remember to make sure and support the poor. And Paul says, yep, I was already already planning to do that. Galatians 2, 9 through 10. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas. I just like that. They gave to me and Barnabas. Everybody says you're supposed to use the other person's name first. But yet here, they gave to me and Barnabas. And, and no, Paul is not using me wrong because this is in the objective. So me, he gave to me. He didn't, you don't give to I, you give to me. So he gave to me and Barnabas. But if you say, me and Barnabas went down to the shop, right, that, that's different because then you're the subject, right? It's Barnabas and I, right? But in this case, he gave to me and Barnabas. So. Anyway, they gave to me and Barnabas the hands of fellowship and or that we should go unto the heathen, that is to the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision, to the Jews. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. So they just wanted to remember, I want you guys to remember the poor. You don't forget about that. And, and Paul was already forward to do that. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 16. 1 Timothy 5, 16. Paul says here, If any man or woman that believeth, so we're talking about church members here, have widows, 
Let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So Paul set forth the, the, the qualifications here for a widow indeed. She has to be 60. She has to have only been married once. Uh, she has to be desolate, so she has to have nothing. She's basically poor, trusts in God, continues in prayer, supplications night and day. And um, she has to have been blameless and um, washed the saints' feet and a whole bunch of other things. Been, just been a good Christian woman, essentially. Those are the ones that the church takes care of. But if any other, if any man or woman have other widows that don't meet those qualifications, then they're supposed to take care of their own widows. The church is not to be charged with that. And then we have James 1, 27. be the last um, verse on this point <clears throat> that we, as part of our giving to the Lord, is taking care of the poor. James 1, 27. <clears throat> James says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now, that, does that say that specifically to give to the fatherless and widows? Well, what else did James say? If you see somebody who, has things that are, who lacks things that are needful for the body and you say unto him, depart in peace, go ye be warmed and filled, and give not him the things that he needs, what good is that? Faith without works is dead. So when you visit the for, the fatherless and the widows, it's not just to go in and say, hi, how you doing? Right? It would also include taking care of them. Like it says, the Lord hath visited his people. And when he did that, he blessed them. Right? He visited them with help. I have a no. I have a, I have an... Just an inkling. If I looked up that word "visit," it would have something to do with giving. But I don't. I don't I'm not going to say that right now because I don't know. But I just have some kind of a hunch that that's the case. Now the next question would be: How much of one's income is considered the first fruits? Give it the Lord of thy substance of the first fruits of all that increase. So how much is that? That would be the next one. So under the the law of Moses, the first fruits of one's increase was a tithe, which is a tenth. Second Chronicles 31, verses 4 through 5. Second Chronicles 31, 4 through 5. Moreover, he commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. We already read that verse. Now look at the next one. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey, and of all the increase of the field, and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. <clears throat> so this is telling us that the tithe of all things was the first fruits of the corn, wine, oil, honey, and all the increase. So the first fruits were a tithe or a tenth. That's what tithe means. So giving the first fruits was proportional giving because when you give a tenth, that's a percentage. So that means one person's tithe is not going to be the same size as another person's tithe. It's the same percentage, but it's not the same amount. If you make a hundred grand a year, your tithe, if you were act, I mean, when I say tithe, I mean 10%, 10% would be 10,000 a year. If you make 10,000 a year, your tithe would be 1,000, right? So it's not the same dollar amount, but it's the same percentage amount, but it, that's proportional giving. So if the crop was plenteous, the first fruits would be plenteous. If the crop was paltry due to a drought, the first fruits would be paltry, right? <clears throat> That's why God didn't, it would, it would be very unfair for God to specify a certain amount. Like every person gives 10 bushels of grain when some guy may have only been able to harvest nine bushels of grain, you know, that, that obviously he starved himself to death. So that's why the Lord made it a proportional thing percentage wise. So what about today under the New Testament? That's the question. <clears throat> there is no explicit command to give 10% in the New Testament, <clears throat> but it does teach proportional giving. Remember 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. It says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. 
So you lay by in store as God hath prospered you. So when God has prospered you more, you lay more in store. When he's prospered you less, you lay less in store. That's percentage proportional giving. <clears throat> so if God's prospered you with much, then you give more. Like I said, if he's prospered you with little, then you give less. So without a specified percentage given by God in the New Testament, then what proportion of a Christian's income should he give? Well, that's up to every man to decide for himself. It says in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7 that we are to purpose in our hearts. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So there's several things in there. According as we purpose in our heart, so we should purpose in our heart to give. That means you decide ahead of time what you're going to give. And I would say, based on everything we read in the Bible, that would be a percentage, not a fixed amount. So you purpose in your heart, you decide ahead of time what percentage you're going to give, and then you stick to that. And you take that off the top, not the leftovers. Right? That's what the Scripture teaches. Now, <clears throat> I can't tell anybody else what to give, but I can say that as for me and my house, we're, we do, and, and I have since I've been converted even before that, followed in the steps of Abraham and Isaac, following their example and giving a tenth of my gross income to the Lord. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews 7, 1 through 6. I've told you this before, and this is my, the way that I see it. I personally cannot justify giving anything less than 10% because I, I don't know where I would come up with a, with a, with a number less than that. Um, I just, you know, I see it Abraham, I see it in Jacob, I see it in Old Testament Israel, I see it the whole way um, through the Old Testament, and then I see Paul making application to the law of Moses in, in 1 Corinthians 9 when he says that they that preach the gospel should live with the gospel and they live with the things, you know, partakers of the altar and so on, referring back to the law of Moses. So when I put all that together, I just, there's just no way that I could say, well, I'll just give 3%, or whatever, you know, like, I, it would just be an arbitrary number and I'd have no justification for it whatsoever. So I personally can't go there. But I'm not telling anybody else what to do. I'm just telling you that I, you know, that my conscience would never allow me to do that. Uh, Hebrews 7, 1 through 6. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, so Abraham gave a tenth, in other words, the first fruits, remember that's a tenth, of all his increase. You know, tenth part of all. First being, inter being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Talking about Melchizedek. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without contradiction, the less is blessed to the better. So Abraham gave a tenth of all the spoils that he received whenever he went and rescued his nephew Lot and beat the soup out of all those kings. He gave a tithe to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here you have Abraham, the man of faith, the man whom is held up in the New Testament as the pattern of faith that we should follow, giving Jesus, giving the, the, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, the type of Jesus Christ, a tithe. That's why I say, I just, I mean, it, to me, no brainer. I can't possibly think of any other thing to do myself. Uh, Genesis 28, 20 through 22. Genesis 28, 20 through 22. My only problem since I've been ordained is just trying to figure out what to do with it. Because I don't have a pastor's support. So sometimes I support the other pastors and, you know, I, I find other godly things to do with it um, and helping out people that are in need or whatever. But it's it was easier back then because I, I, I knew what I was going to do with the majority of it. And then I had a little bit left over and then I could figure out what to do with the rest of it. But 
now it's just like, what do I do with it? But it's there anyway, and it's ready. And maybe someday, you know, there'll be lots of use for it because <laughs> if we run into some hard times, you know, then then it'll be there. Uh, Genesis twenty-eight twenty through twenty-two. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Jacob says, If you'll take care of me, and you give me bread to eat and raiment to wear. You provide for my needs, Lord, and I will give you a tenth of all that I possess. And that's what I promised the Lord a long time ago, that I would give him at least a tenth. And I've always, I've always stuck to that through thick and thin. And, re- and I, I realize that this is probably, this is not something that I would hold anybody else to. But there have even been times in my life when my income wouldn't even pay the bills and yet I still gave the Lord a tenth. So it's essentially living off savings and giving the Lord a tenth. But that was just my conviction. I thought, you know what? I'm not worried about it. The Lord is going to take care of me. And it just wouldn't, it just, my conscience just wouldn't have been okay with, with doing otherwise. I'm not holding anybody else to that standard. And I, I mean, I've even heard pastors preach and say that you wouldn't be required to do that. And I don't think you would be required to do that. But that was just, my thing and and it's already worked out fine for me so i'm not not worried about it so anyway that takes care of proverbs 3 and verse 9 next time we'll look at proverbs 3:10 which gives us the blessing associated with